Welcome back to another episode of Clinicians Brief, the podcast, where we bring you the conversations behind the content. I'm your host, Dr. Alyssa Watson, and joining me today is a distinguished guest who brings a wealth of expertise to our discussion, Dr. Candace Chu. Dr. Chu is a board-certified clinical pathologist, and she's here today to talk about a topic that every clinician should really pay close attention to, the top three conditions missed by skipping urinalysis. So we all know that urinalysis is often an overlooked diagnostic tool, but it is an important key to uncovering health issues in all of our patients. And so Dr. Chu is going to guide us through the nuances of performing a thorough urinalysis, as well as share some insights on how neglecting this essential diagnostic step might hinder our ability to diagnose certain conditions early on in the disease process when we still have a lot of time to do something about them. So whether you're a new grad or a seasons practitioner like me, by the end of this episode, I really hope you find yourself reconsidering the importance of a urinalysis in your minimum database. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Chu, how are you doing today? Hi, I'm doing good. Good, I'm so glad that you are able to come and sit down with us uh, before we talk about your, your top three conditions that we're going to be um, really sussing out today. Would you mind telling the audience a little bit about your background, um, where you went to school, and what you're doing now. Sure. Um, so I'm originally from Taiwan, which is a small island country in the southeast of China and below Japan. Uh, I did my vet school there um, in Taiwan. The veterinary education system is um, sort of like in British, is like five-year undergrad program. Mm-hmm. And after that, um, I practiced for a short period of time, and I came to Texas in 2014 to start it, uh, start my PhD at Texas A&M University. And then uh, after finish my PhD, I stay on for three more years to finish my clinical pathology residency. So I got boarded uh, in 2021, and I moved to Pennsylvania to start as assistant professor of clinical pathology at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm currently in the stage of career transitioning, thinking about what would be my next step. All right. Well, that's exciting. Yes, it is. (laughs) So... What are some of the biggest benefits to performing your analysis? And why do you think, like, in your opinion, this diagnostic tool is so underutilized in veterinary medicine? Yeah, so I think the biggest benefit for performing your analysis, uh, first of all, is um, for animals with like non-specific clinical signs. For example, like anorexia, lethargy, weight loss, like you really don't know what happened. It is better to obtain a, a comprehensive minimal database, which include your analysis. And also, I think every time when you have a complete blood count, CBC, or you have a routine biochemistry analysis, it's always good to have your analysis on the side as well. And third, of course, uh, for animals with like suspected or have known urinary tract disease or any kidney diseases, your analysis is a must. And um, I'm saying that it has been underutilized uh, is because based on a recent uh, survey published this year, which include like a total number of um, more than a thousand uh, first opinion clinicians, they found that um, they usually perform your analysis way less frequently at uh, than the frequency they perform blood work during the routine examination. And they're also looking to what are some common reasons for them to skip your analysis. One is um, the client's financial constraint. The other is like difficulty to obtain uh, urine. And also sometimes is the clinician's lack of perceived diagnostic needs. They don't think your analysis is necessary in that situation. Um, However, if we look into... um, the recently published uh, Canine Life Stage Guidelines by AHA or um, the uh, guideline published by the uh, AAFP, we would note that um, for dogs like young adults, mature adults, or senior animals, and for cats more than seven years of age, your analysis is recommended. Um, For cats between one to six age, it kind of depends on their needs. But I think overall, um, my answer to this question is, if we skip your analysis, then that would definitely decrease diagnosis and would impair the management of a lot of uh, diseases. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll have to say that um, 
I certainly fall into, you know, that category of the other clinicians that were surveyed. Um, and those are my top reasons too. So, you know, financial constraints, trying to prioritize what test I think is most important to get me to the answer, you know, um, as quickly as possible, as well as, you know, that just the extra step and difficulty oftentimes in obtaining a urine sample, you know, a, sure. the animal urinated right before they came in. Uh, I don't have access to all <laughs> ultrasound, like, you know, lots of things like that, you know, make that one little um, extra step more difficult. When we look at doing your analysis, you know, in, in clinical practice, what are some advantages and disadvantages of performing that your analysis, like in house versus sending it out to a commercial diagnostic lab? Sure. Um, I definitely uh, would strongly encourage clinicians to do your analysis in house, because it gets your results back fairly quickly within 30, 25, 30 minutes, and also generate income for the hospital and also preserve some uh, fragile components in the urine like casts. It might disappear uh, during uh, storage or during treatment. Um, however, I understand that a lot of clinicians um, try to avoid doing your analysis in-house is because uh, sediment examination is not their uh, specialty. Uh, if there is a lack of like trained personnel in the, clinic, uh, in the clinics, then that definitely would decrease the possibility of doing that in-house. And then um, another factor I think need to be taken into consideration is uh, a lot of times those in-house analysis is lack of uh, SOP. Um, so we usually recommend to having uh, three to five mil of urine for uh, centrifugation when you do your analysis every time you have a fixed volume of urine so you can compare the results. But a lot of times, you know, um, your analysis are performed on one mil of urine, next time on five mil of urine. So it's a, there's a lack of standardization. Um, for that, um, I think recently on the clinician's brief, there is a very good article called uh, Top Five Your Analysis Errors in Veterinary Medicine. In that article, they particularly talk about how um, to fix the issue of not having a standard volume um, of urine when doing your analysis. Absolutely. That's uh, an article by Dr. Pullman, and yes. she is a favorite on the podcast. <laughs> so, um, yep, that's a good one. We'll link it down below for everybody, um, you know, when we link this as well. So, um, as you kind of alluded to, time is really a precious resource when we're in the practice. And so do you have tips on just how to streamline interpretation, you know, with things like the reagent strips and, and the sediment exam? Yeah, so I typically, when I get the urine, um, make sure it's in room temperature, and then you mix it well, take one drop on the refractometer to do the urine-specific gravity. And usually at the same time, I can have the strip um, laid down the table beside me, and I can do the strip like at the same time. Because um, if you read the labeling on the on the container very closely, you will notice that you actually need to look at specific pad at a specific time. So um, the, the quickest one, you still need to wait about 30 seconds. So I usually do that and then immediately put a fixed volume of urine into the tube and put down in the centrifuge for like five minutes. And during that same time, I can read the uh, urine specific gravity results and I can get the uh, urine dipstick results. And once I have the urine out and discard the subinatum and only keep about 10% of the urine at the bottom, mix it well and put it on the slide with the cover slick. Then I have the wet mount urine sediment to look at. So the whole process, if you're really familiar with the whole process, I would say only take about 20 minutes, including Perfect. the urine, uh, urine sediment examination. So now that we've kind of gone over the logistics of, you know, doing a urinalysis and why it's so important to do it, you know, as part of your min minimum database, Let's talk about these three, you know, conditions that you highlighted in your article. So the first one is going to be proteinuria. And, and I will tell you as a clinician, proteinuria is one that I, <laughs> it's just 
I, I always have that moment. I have algorithms that I go back to and trying to figure out, you know, how to prioritize running these tests. So I'm so glad you're here to walk us through this. Um, first off, there can be things that can cause false positives and false negatives, especially on those urine dipstick pads that we use. So could you, could you walk us through that? Yeah, sure. Um, so we know that the uh, protein urine dipstick pad change color because um, based on the ability of the free amino groups that binds to um, the reagent. And it is m much more sensitive to albumin than any other type of proteins. Um, some possible reason to cause a false positive is when you have um, visible hematuria. So the mm -hmm. urine color is different. And then also when you have very alkaline urine, that could also cause false positives as well. Sometimes in the situation where there is uh, contamination with uh, disinfectants, for example, like um, quaternary ammonium or like chlorhexidine mm -hmm. could cause false positives as well. And also like if you have active sediment, those could be from uh, the cells or bacteria in the urine instead of the actual protein component in the urine. And then uh, for false negative, um, when you have a very diluted urine, sometimes you can get, get negative result, even though there is protein urea present, or you have very acidic urine, the pH value is less than six, or um, if there are non-albumin um, proteins because the pet is much less sensitive to them, so you will also get false negative result. And then should you interpret proteinuria always in conjunction with urine specific gravity? I, I've kind of sometimes heard recommendations that if as long as your urine is really concentrated, that that, that proteinuria might not be significant. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so we talk about causes of like uh, false negative results on the um, protein dipstick pad. Um, one of the reason is if you have really low urine specific gravity, for example, like 1001 to uh, 1017, then it is possible you have false negative protein dipstick result. And then um, the other thing to consider is um, comparing to um, two urine have the same um, urine dipstick result, for example, like two plus protein urea is much more severe in that patient with dilute urine uh, compared to the patient with concentrated urine. Um, but sometimes if we take like steps back and thinking about um, looking at a very strong positive result on the urine dipstick, for example, like three plus to four plus, in that situation, it might not be important to think about oh, whether this is dilute urine or, uh, or concentrating urine, because when you see a very strong positive results, um, usually protein urea is really present regardless of urine specific gravity. And then the next step, once you have, you know, detected protein on the dipstick is to, is to move forward with that urine protein creatinine ratio. Um, can you talk a little bit about why multiple measurements are encouraged and they should be taken on different, you know, different occasions, different days, and how far apart should those uh, uh, samples be taken when we're trying to confirm like persistent proteinuria in a patient? Yeah, so um, if you look into a literature, they usually recommend you to have like two to three separate measurements with like two, three weeks apart. So I would say um, in the total of like six weeks, you need to have at least two to three measurements. And that is because um, the protein secretion in urine has its biological variation. So it is very important that you document a uh, protein urea to be consistent and not just a one-time event. Okay. What are some of the broad categories of proteinuria? Um, like, is all proteinuria due to glomerular disease or can you get proteinuria for other reasons? Yeah, so to answer this question, we have to look into the mechanism of like how protein are filtered and reabsorbed in the nephron. Um, so there are four possible mechanisms for uh, these two protein urea. The first one is if there is like increased filtration of protein through glomeruli. So that means in glomerular disease, you will definitely see protein urea. 
And the second is actually due to decreased reabsorption of tubular cells. So if you have tubular damage, then you will see proteinuria as well. So usually when we talk about proteinuria, we talk about, you know, pre-renal, renal, post-renal component. Renal component will include both a glomeruli and also tubular. And then uh, if you have interstitial inflammation, that will also cause proteinuria as well. And of course, um, there are mechanisms involved like what happened in the lower urinary tract that's below the kidney, and that's what we call post-renal uh, post proteinuria. Does the magnitude of that proteinuria help you localize it at all? Uh, yeah, usually it provides like a rough um, estimation if you see like a very high UPC that usually indicate the presence of glomerular diseases. However, it is not always true because there have been studies that found dogs um, with biopsy proven the chronic kidney disease. The median UPC can be 3.9 and the whole range can be like 0 0.6 to 8.6. Um, so I usually recommend if you want to figure out whether this is true, uh, the protein urea is truly due to glomerular disease. Um, you can actually submit the urine sample to the International Veterinary uh, Renal Pathology Service at Texas University. They do perform a uh, urinary protein electrophoresis, or we call SDS page. And on that result, uh, it can differentiate um, those different molecules in the in, in protein urea. So if you see like median to high uh, molecular protein, for example, like albumin, then it will indicate the dog have glomerular disease. Whereas if you see like low molecular weight proteins that uh, gear more toward um, tubular damage. And then let's talk a little bit about kind of that situation where I alluded to at the beginning of this topic, where we have kind of this um, otherwise normal healthy patient comes in for, you know, wellness uh, uh, examination, lab work, minimum database, and we find proteinuria. How quickly should we investigate this? Like, um, you know, how do we impress upon the client the importance of following up with this test because, you know, following up on this finding? Because the tests we're talking about do have, you know, a financial commitment as well as, you know, time if we're going out six weeks, you know, to really try to document this. Yeah, that is a very good question. So for example, if we have a uh, apparently healthy adult dog with like one plus uh, dipstick reaction, but the urine uh, UPC is less than 0 0.2, in that situation, I probably would try to exclude uh, possibilities for a false positive result. Uh, make sure that I do have inactive urine sediment. And I also would try to establish that this is a persistent protein urea by measure three times within six weeks, as I mentioned. And um, also definitely looking to UPC, um, if the UPC is still within the low or like borderline value, for example, like 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 in cats or 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 in dogs, then I'll probably repeat it every two to four months. And if, um, as I following the situation, the UPC escalates, then I will start to think about adding like blood pressure or um, biochemistry analysis to look into whether there is chronic kidney disease or acute kidney injury or some other systemic disease that, that is present. Yeah. So having kind of a stepwise approach to these is really good so that we're not really kind of throwing the kitchen sink at these patients, yes. so to speak. Um, you know, there are a number of uh, infectious diseases that can that we can see proteinuria along with. Um, could you just speak quickly as to, you know, how do you prioritize those types of tests, like SNAP tests and, and things like that, looking for like lepto or something? Yeah, uh, if the uh, client don't have financial constraints, I would definitely recommend I just run a 4DX test, you know, just to get rid of the uh, suspicion right away. Um, but if uh, there is a financial constraint, uh, we can go back to the algorithm that I mentioned before, try to establish the situation first, and then discuss all the possibility with the client and see if they want to pursue uh, additional diagnostic tests.
scratching your head over your patient's test results? Reach for the Clinician's Brief Algorithm Collection for guidance on a wide range of cases, from cardiac arrhythmias to refractory dermatophytosis. Order your guide to hundreds of clinical presentations at cliniciansbrief.com slash algorithms. So let's move on from proteinuria. We're going to talk about a Fanconi syndrome a little bit. Um, this is this is one of those conditions, you know, kind of one of those zebra conditions we call them in vet school that I learned about, and I've 20 years in practice and I've I've never actually seen it. Um, but I I've always remembered that kind of the hallmark of this condition is glucosuria in the absence of hyperglycemia. Um, so could you just briefly go back and, and explain the underlying mechanism that lead to glucosuria in these cases um, and, you know, how Fanconi syndrome can be either inherited or acquired because, you know, there are the two different forms. Yeah, so uh, Fanconi syndrome is caused by proximal tubular dysfunction. So that also goes back to the uh, physiology of the nephron. Uh, when we think about the function of proximal tubule that is responsible for like reabsorbing almost all filtered glucose and amino acids. And also uh, it's responsible for reabsorbing 90% of bicarb and also some other mo molecule uh, like potassium, phosphate, and calcium. So in a situation where you have a proximal tubular dysfunction like in Fanconi syndrome, then you expect to see, um, usually you expect to see like glucose urea, and generalize uh, amino acid urea, but there also be like varying degree of um, bicarb that you would see in the urine or phosphate or ketone, um, sometimes even protein as well. Um, but for confirming the diagnosis, you have to send a urine sample to University of Pennsylvania, their uh, division of medical genetics um, to look into the amino acids in the urine. And um, as you mentioned, it also like be divided into congenital and acquired. Um, congenital is usually seen in Basenji dogs, um, but there are reports in other breeds as well, for example, like Border Terrier or uh, Irish Wolfhound. Um, for acquired Fanconi syndrome in dogs, uh, it's believed to associate it with the ingredients imported from China, um, the jerky treats um, that has um, recently been mentioned. But I think um, looking to literature that they haven't identified the exact toxin who caused Fanconi syndrome in jerky treats, but that's definitely something we need to keep in mind. Okay. And then what are the most common clinical signs or presenting complaints in these patients, or do they come in completely asymptomatic? Yeah, it is possible that it come in completely asymptomatic, but, but when usually they have uh, glucose urea, you will have associated PUPD secondary to that. Um, and also it has been reported in some dogs, they already develop a clinical signs associated with chronic kidney disease or acute kidney injury as well. Can you talk a little bit about, um, does the prognosis and the management differ between those two forms of Fanconi, between the inherited form and the acquired form? Yes, um, but I have to say that I'm not a clinician, so I cannot speak too much about the treatment. Um, however, it is my understanding that um, the glucose urea typically resolved within weeks to months. Um, following the discontinuation of that jerky treats. Um, but sometimes the azotemia or the chronic kidney disease still persists. And for congenital Fanconi syndrome in Basenji dogs, um, there is uh, the Ganto protocol that's been uh, published on, on the website that um, includes like how you correct uh, electrolyte imbalance as well as how you uh, do a nutrition management in those Basenji dogs. Um, usually the lifespan is unaffected. However, um, end stage chronic kidney disease is usually the most common cause of death for those Basenjis. Okay. Glucose urea is a really common finding in cats. Um, uh, but my understanding, and I could be wrong, is that is that cats don't get the inherited form of Fanconi syndrome, or at least it hasn't been reported. Do we see acquired Fanconi syndrome in cats? 
Yes, um, it is also my understanding that inherited Fanconi syndrome has not been reported in cats. However, the acquired case has been reported in 2016, where there are four cats treated with Columbusol um, developed uh, Fanconi syndrome, and after like 20 to 26 months into the treatment, and then they do have partial or complete uh, resolution of that. Um, in three out of the four cats within three months of discontinuing that therapy. But the exact uh, mechanism, um, they still don't understand. Lots of things to look into and research. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Our last topic is one that is, you know, I find a really hot topic right now, um, not just in, you know, clinical pathology, um, but internal medicine and, and, you know, multiple, multiple disciplines in veterinary medicine right now. And, and that's going to be, you know, subclinical or occult bacteriuria. Um, so can let's start by just like defining subclinical bacteriuria and maybe why we don't use the word asymptomatic bacteriuria when we're talking about our, our veterinary patients. Yeah. Um, so if we look into the term um, bacteriuria, it's defined as the presence of bacteria in the urine, usually like regardless of the quantity. Um, so whether you observe it in the urine sediment examination or um, you see it as a positive urinary culture, then we can all, all say that it is this bacteria. Um, in human medicine, they tend to use the term asymptomatic bacteria. However, it does not apply to veterinary patients because um, the clinicians, we don't know uh, what symptoms the animals are experiencing. So rather, we can only observe their clinical signs. So I think it's better that we use the term subclinical in case that the animal is actually symptomatic but it's just being uh, neglected by the animal owners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a hard one to remember. I slip up and use asymptomatic all the time. <laughs> so in fact, I think I did it earlier in the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you did say that, you know, either identification of bacteria on the sediment as well as culture can be used, you know, when we're talking, when we're, we're making this diagnosis. Do we know, do we have an idea of what bacteria, which, you know, types of bacteria are most often associated with subclinical bacteriuria? Yeah. Um, so when I talking about like either um, observing in the urine sediment or in the bacteria culture, it's just more like broader term. Like generally when we talk about bacteriuria, we want to see that. Um, but in the recent publication, I think they more and more emphasize that culture is required. Um, for example, um, in 2019, there is an article published in the Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery. They talk about using 1,000 uh, colony forming units, uh, CFU, to um, draw a line between positive and negative like urine culture results. And in that paper, they also talk about the most common bacteria associated with subclinical uh, bacteriuria, which is not surprising, E. coli. <laughs> And that then, would have been uh, my guess. <laughs> yes, yes. And then also um, talk about like streptococcus species, enterococcus, and staphylococcus to be um, also common bacteria to see. Yeah, yeah. Enterococcus is another one I, I just, you know, from from an anecdotal standpoint, I feel like yes. I see a lot of, yeah. Um, do we have an indication, do we have an idea of the prevalence of subclinical bacteria area when we're talking about populations of healthy dogs and cats? Yeah, I think it's actually uh, way more prevalent than we thought. Um, based on the previous study in healthy dogs, there are like 2.1 to 12%. In cats could be 6.1 to even 13% have subclinical bacteria area. Yeah, I, I found that number, I was really surprised by that number, you know, 12% I thought was really high. <laughs> um, are there concurrent diseases or other risk factors that are associated with subclinical bacteriuria? Yeah, of course. Um, so basically, when we think about like older animals or obese animals, they have increased risk. Also, if you think about animals who like... Um, anatomical abnormalities, uh, for example, like vulva involution or like ectopic ureter, 
then definitely uh, would have increased risk as well. And then we need to think about if they have difficulty in uh, completely empty the bladder. For example, when they have like a spinal cord injury that will cause an increased risk. And the big category is like immune compromised animals. For example, with, if they have cushions or they have uh, diabetes mellitus or hyperthyroidism, that will also increase the risk. Sure. And then, um, you know, I know we're going to talk just a little bit about treatment. And um, I know you said that's not your area of focus usually, (laughs) but could we let's at least just talk about the current understanding of why antimicrobial treatment is not recommended in most of these cases of subclinical bacteriuria? Sure. And then... um... I definitely need to mention another great article on clinician's brief. Um, It's called Management of Subclinical Bacteria. So that definitely go into more detail on this topic. Um, But it is my understanding that um, using uh, antimicrobial treatment in this situation does not bring any benefits because those animals don't have any clinical signs to begin with. And it also brings concern that it will eventually lead to a antibiotic like multi-drug resistance in those bacteria and that will we we kept talking about you know like antimicrobial stewardship is very important topic in veterinary medicine so we definitely wanted to avoid that from happening yeah absolutely well we certainly won't ever discourage you from plugging our other content (laughs) (laughs) i did my homework (laughs) you it's wonderful this has been a great discussion you know i really enjoyed your article and uh hopefully our audience got you know several tips today um at the end of our episodes, we always play a little game. And I know <laughs> I told you, you know, before we before we jumped on that there was going to be a little game. And what it is, it's a series of just would you rather questions. It's just for fun. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. OK, sure. Bring it on. OK. All right. Now, I love that attitude. <laughs> so would you rather repeat your Ph.D. training or would you rather go back and repeat high school? Oh, high school, definitely. Oh, really? It's, you love high school? It's not that I don't enjoy my PhD. I enjoyed <laughs> very much in those four years. Um, so I work with Dr. Mary Nebody during my PhD. Mm-hmm. And I often talk to other people, you know, if I have the option, I would totally marry her because I love her so much. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not that I don't enjoy my PhD. It's just that I had so much fun with my high school mm-hmm. classmates. So I would rather choose that. Oh, that's so wonderful. Yeah. And also okay. very importantly, sorry. Yes, go uh, on. No, yeah, yeah go my, hus- my husband is my high school sweetheart. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I would relive yes. those years too yes. then. That would be so much fun. That would yeah. be so much fun. Okay. Um, so, so I know you're transitioning right now, but if you were at an academic you know, institution right now and one of your colleagues was out sick, and you had to cover a lecture last minute with no preparation, would you rather it be freshman year biochemistry or junior year veterinary ethics? Mm, Definitely not biochemistry. (laughs) I think I can talk a little bit about ethics like on top of my head, Mm -hmm. but for biochemistry, you definitely need some time to prepare for that. You need a little time to prepare, yes. Yes. Yeah. bad flashbacks of of freshman year biochem for me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Would you rather focus solely on lab research and never get to teach students or continue teaching, but never get to step foot back in the lab again? Well, that would be a tough question for me. Um, I would actually prefer teaching students. And I think that's the main reason for me Um, to chose a career in academia at the first place. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Oh, this one is a good one. All right. (laughs) Okay. Is the correct pronunciation of the word R-E-N-I-N renin or renin? Renin, I think based on my understanding, but I'm not sure. You cannot quote me on that (laughs) because I'm from Taiwan. (laughs) I think people pronounce it both ways all of the time. I don't think there is a correct way. Yeah, I right. prefer the first one. The first one. That's what I. That's normally what I say too. Is Renan. So yeah. Yes. Those Renan people don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> all right. Last question. 
Would you rather attend a really important social event with diff quick stain all over your fingers or the faint smell of formalin in your hair? Oh, definitely diff, <laughs> diff quick stain. Don't you smell, don't smell formalin. Like formalin. <laughs> yes, you don't want okay. to get cancer. Okay. Don't do that. Stay healthy. <laughs> all right. See, that wasn't so bad, was it? Yeah, no, it wasn't so bad. <laughs> Those right. are the questions I can't answer without preparations. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you again for coming on the show today. Um, and everyone at home, we hope you found this uh, episode informative and thought provoking. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for having me. See you next time. Thank you all for listening to today's episode of Clinicians Brief, the podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, you can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts, including a video version that we have on YouTube. While you're there, make sure you subscribe, rate, and review us. You can also listen to or watch our podcast episodes on our website at cliniciansbrief.com slash podcasts. Or if you'd like, drop us a line at podcasts at vetmedics.com. Clinicians Brief the Podcast is a Vet Medics production produced by Alexis Ussery and hosted by me. Dr. Alyssa Watson.